It's the Maxwell Institute podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. We are extremely excited that the Maxwell Institute Study Edition of the Book of Mormon has finally been published. We published it in partnership with BYU's Religious Studies Center and with Deseret Book. This is a watershed moment in the history of Latter-day Saints scripture. It's the first study edition ever published by a church affiliate here at BYU. The book has new formatting, useful new footnotes, and original artwork. Editor Grant Hardy and artist Brian Kershisnik join us in this episode to talk about the book, all the work that went into it. Questions and comments can be sent to mipodcast at byu.edu. Grant Hardy, welcome to the Maxwell Institute podcast today. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. And Brian Kershisnik joins us as well. Glad to be here, Blair. So we're talking about the Maxwell Institute study edition of the Book of Mormon. And Grant, you've worked with a lot of religious texts from different religious traditions. What are some of the texts that you've done academic work with? So I did some uh, a graduate course in Chinese Buddhist texts. That was sort of the technical thing. And then I've had an opportunity to do a, a teaching company course on sacred texts of the world that allowed me to do a broad survey of uh, texts from different religious traditions. So from Hinduism, like the Mahabharata and the Bhagavad Gita and the Quran, of course, and Sikh scriptures and um, the, the Torah and, and uh, Chinese classics, Confucian classics, just sort of the whole gamut. This seems like a really simple question, but I think it's one of the most complex questions out there. What makes a text religious? I'm not sure that it's anything inherent in the text itself, because the term religious text spans such a wide variety of genres and, and approaches. But what makes a text scripture is that believers give that text a certain authority authority. It's not like a favorite novel or something that inspires them at, or that they like to, but it's something that they feel has a claim on their life and oftentimes allows them some access to something beyond the mundane, the, the ordinary, the, hmm. the supernatural, the divine. And what are some of these different genres that you refer to? So there are narratives, stories, sacred stories, and then there are revelations where a divinity is speaking directly to a prophet, to a mortal. There are law books that are law codes that are seen as scripture. We have that in the, in the Hebrew Bible. The poetry is, can be seen as scripture, as in the Sikh Adi Granth, which is just all poetry. So the idea of scripture can incorporate lots of those different kinds of texts. Yeah, and you see something like the Bible incorporate some of those different genres within itself. You have law code type stuff, you have narrative, you have some poetry. Well, sometimes coming from a Protestant background, people think of the Bible as a book, but, it, but it's not a book. It's a library of, as you say, different types of writing written by different people from different perspectives over about a thousand year period. So as you have been working in, and learning about these other religious texts, is there anything from that study that you, that you brought to the Book of Mormon? And it's a text that you revere as a believer in the divinity of that text, sure. uh, but also using your scholarly tools to look through that text. So from the studies of other religious texts, what have you brought to your study of the Book of Mormon? Part of it is a recognition of how unusual the genre is of, of narrative scripture. There's some in the Bible, but of course it's not the, the entire Bible. The, the Psalms are not narrative. The wisdom books are not narrative. So there's some of those, those histories. And when I looked at the Book of Mormon, I was able to see or perceive, I thought, some poetry and some narrative. Um, most scriptures, particularly in recent times, since the recent times means since the Quran, <laughs> are, are uh, revelations that are exhortations, they're commandments that come, like the Doctrine and Covenants. The Doctrine and Covenants is a, is a much more typical volume of recent scripture. The Book of Mormon does theology, but it does so within a narrative. So you do get sermons and speeches that try to explicate some doctrinal points, but it's always told by someone at a particular time to a particular audience, and then that's chosen by a narrator as part of a larger collection. There's, there's always this backstory, even for parts of the Book of Mormon that are not necessarily, you know, it came to pass that so-and-so did 
such and such. And then how about the other way? Is there anything about your study of the Book of Mormon that informed your study of other religious texts or that helped you in your study of other religious texts? That's probably a trickier question. It is a trickier question. Some of my work on the Book of Mormon has been done for for members of the church, for Latter-day Saints, but I teach at a state university, and a lot of my work has been done through academic presses from Oxford or from Illinois, and I'm very aware, or try to stay aware, of what it means to be invited to read the Book of Mormon as an outsider. And of course, that's the perspective that I have with other texts, is to try to learn how to take a text that means a great deal to someone else, that kind of informs their life even, or gives it shape, their their mental world. And that may not be a mental world or a belief system that I share, but I want to treat that respectfully and with dignity and, and with an awareness of what that means to others. And I guess it's the golden rule, right? I want to treat other people's scriptures the way that I hope that they would treat my school. Yeah. So more than 10 years ago, you published the reader's edition of the Book of Mormon, similar to this edition with the University of Illinois Press. When you finished that edition, and we'll talk about some of the differences, did you think your work was done? Did you think, okay, I have this reader's edition out. I'm, I'm good to go. No. <laughs> and the reason was, I always knew that the University of Illinois Press volume, the reader's edition, was aimed at at scholars, at academics, at outsiders, and so I wrote the introduction in a way that would make sense to outsiders. I had always hoped that more members of the church would be able to to read and appreciate the Book of Mormon in this new format, but most Latter-day Saints don't look to university presses when they go for scripture study sorts of things, so I, I had always hoped that there would be a way to to bring that to a, a wider audience of my, of my fellow believers. Yeah, and so that's kind of the genesis of this current project. So what are some of the differences then? You mentioned one, which is the reader's edition was sort of geared more toward outsiders written in, a, in an academic press. Uh, what are some other differences between that version and the one that the Maxwell Institute just published? Well, there are some some obvious similarities. So that both of these editions of the Book of Mormon are formatted like modern translations of the Bible with paragraphs and quotation marks and and indented primary source documents and, and poetic stanzas. That's not particularly original. That's going to be the same. But what this new study edition does is it integrates the work of Royal Skousen's textual criticism, not in the text itself. The text itself is the 2013 edition that the church generously allowed us to reproduce. But in the footnotes are several hundred examples of readings from the printer's manuscript or the original manuscript that I think will, actually they're often better readings that were lost accidentally in the transmission of the text. So that's an important thing. And then also for... And the, let me say real quick too, ahead. on Royal Skousen, for people who don't know his work, he's done a critical text project. He continues to do a critical text project mm -hmm. of the Book of Mormon. He's a scholar who has meticulously gone through the original manuscript of the Book of Mormon and the printer's manuscript. It was a copy of that manuscript. And 20 editions. And Yeah, and then 20 editions of the Book of Mormon. Mm -hmm. And he has meticulously looked through every single one of them over a quarter of a century, this has taken him, to find every little variant, every little mm -hmm. scratched out word or something that there was changed. There is punctuation in the editions, and he has compared all of the punctuation in all of the editions. Yeah, so he's gone through and done this. And then you've gone through that work, probably one of the few in the world that's actually gone through every... <laughs> every published more people should do that yeah it was a great, it was a great yeah it's a, but that is such a huge project so uh, while it's really worthwhile you've also by going through narrowed some of that down to some of the to, things to that the, are more to relevant. the variants that i thought would be most helpful yeah. for the current edition which is a yeah. different project than what he's done in reconstructing right. the, the earliest text right right and and we're grateful for him for giving his blessing to to use the that information his research in this project as well so he's a, he's a great friend yeah shout colleague. out to i really him. admire his, yeah. his work Good. All right. So go on. You were talking about oh. the differences. Yeah. So another difference is in the Book of Mormon, there are lengthy passages, sometimes a chapter or more that are taken from Isaiah or from Matthew. And sometimes there are differences between the version in the Book of Mormon, in the English Book of Mormon and the King James Version. They're, they're quite similar, but there are occasional differences. And I've indicated where those differences are with bold and sometimes with some footnotes. And in those cases, the Book of Mormon functions almost like a commentary, and you can more easily see where Nephi or Jacob has added something in, so that becomes readily accessible, those differences. 
And then there's some additional things there, a new introduction that you mentioned, and then some new charts. and, and Well, an old introduction, it uses the church's uh, official introduction. I did write a, an editor's introduction that talks about the history of the text a little bit, yeah. and then some material at the end, which is different. Those are materials that I chose with mostly with college students in mind, thinking about what would be most useful for kind of a college edition of the text. And your introduction says that this edition was prepared with the issue of readability first mm -hmm. and foremost. What makes a text readable, more readable or less readable? Paragraphs. <laughs> there, there's a reason why every other Amen. book that you read is in paragraphs. <laughs> uh, the verses are great for finding specific sentences, but they kind of chop up the story a little bit. So paragraphs helps a great deal. Also, and this is an aesthetic thing, Brian probably will appreciate this, but to have a text that goes all the way across the page instead of in double columns sort of is a little easier on the eye. I also tried to bring out features of the, of the text that are there, but are sometimes hard to see so that it fits together. So the Book of Mormon is a complicated text with lots of different parts that fit together. So for example, in uh, 2 Nephi, when we start with chapter 6, all of a sudden it's a sermon from Jacob, and it goes from chapter 6 to chapter 10, and then we're back to Nephi for 11, and then he, and so I have little headings that say, the speaker here is going to be Jacob for the next five chapters. Yeah, Grant's like counting out, oh wait, let me check <laughs> on that, he's five. counting here to right. check it out, yeah. I've been really fortunate to be involved with this project for a year, I mean, we've been trying to get this all ready for four years or so. Well, it started think, out right? as, a, as a Maxwell Institute uh, endeavor when I yeah. when you invited me to, to teach that summer workshop yeah. in 2015. Yeah, yeah, and you, and you brought this spiral-bound thing that we printed out for everybody. To, yeah. That we gave to students and yes. a, a draft to, to, to road test it a little yeah, bit. Yeah, it's been so fun. I was, I was trying to remember when you first contacted me about the images, and it was at least, that was at least two years ago, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's been a yep. while. Yep, there was a few artists that, that I was thinking about, and, and Morgan Davis, who works here at the Institute, uh, knew Brian already, and so I'm kicking these names around, and Morgan had said, oh, of course, I, I know Brian Krishnick, and you, uh, okay, <laughs> that's great, and I'd, I'd seen well, Brian's there work are, before. There are many talented LDS artists who, who we thought of, and but Brian was our first choice, and we yeah. were overjoyed yeah. when, he, when, he, when yeah. he accepted. Well. No, you were our first choice. <laughs> well, and it was, I mean, we'll talk about this, I imagine, a little later, but it was, I because I don't do illustration. It right. Was, it's an unusual project yeah. for me, but but it it felt good. And, and because I know Morgan, it felt very much like a project with friends. Yeah. You know. And yeah. It's, and so from beginning to end, too, because I remember, like, after the book was printed and, you, and, Brian, you received your copy or a copy or copies, you texted me about, hey, do you know what this footnote means? This, this is very strange. And, and you had me go look at this footnote. And I, oh, do you remember which footnote yeah, it was? I do. To, yeah, say. Uh, it, I feel silly. But yeah, well, it, it stumped us both. It's, so. the, it's the footnote that says, or. Yeah. Oh, right. And so I was I was looking in the key for what OR yeah. was referring to. Yeah. It, it, and, but the thing that I'm threw just, us Hello, I'm not a scholar. What what threw me was the fact that it said or and then it had words there. Yeah. But it it to me I I wasn't seeing the difference. And so I was like, why why is this? Well it was or? the same words, but it was all usually alternative punctuation. punctuation. Right. Which made, yes. which is clarified the yeah. words. And so. Yep. So in the University of Illinois Press edition, didn't you do all the punctuation no, for that no, one? Right. I played around with the punctuation a little bit because okay. the punctuation is not sacred in the same way that the, the text <laughs> yeah. is. It was added by the non-Mormon typesetter, John yes. Gilbert, for the 1830 edition. And he did a pretty good job yeah. just going through the text cold and putting in commas as and he's, semicolons and, as he's, as he's reading it, together, it for yeah. the first time. Yeah. <laughs> and and the punctuation that we have in the, the official text now, the 2013 edition, is pretty much his punctuation. Yeah. He did a good job. But there are places where... If you change the punctuation, it makes a difference in the meaning yeah. and sometimes clarifies things. Yeah. And so rather than put those in the text itself, because we pretty much kept the punctuation that was there, except for when I needed to switch things to add quotation marks or poetry, but the punctuation is the standard punctuation. But I put in footnotes saying, yeah. here's how it would look with commas yeah. in a different place. Dashes often. And use. dashes, yeah, are, and sometimes some, some parentheses to right. say, oh, right. this it looks like a parenthetical yeah. comment. If I were doing the punctuation, I might do it a little bit this way. Actually, yeah. a lot of that comes from Royal's work as, yeah. as well. Yeah, well, it's interesting. Like, I remember at the uh, little seminar that you did here at the Institute several years ago, one of the exercises that you had students do is to take an, non, an unpunctuated page and punctuate it. And just that exercise brings you into the text in a way that, that 
that I'd never encountered it before and could introduce some interesting alternate readings just based on, you know, it sounds like we're being really nitpicky about parentheses and dashes, but they can actually make pretty big differences in how the text so sounds. The, so the study edition has kind of two functions. One is, I think it's a little easier to read. It just, not easier, but it flows more because of the paragraphs and the long lines and such. And for that reason, I think it's easier to sit down and read 20 or 30 pages of the Book of Mormon. Or for people who are new to the Book of Mormon, it will just help them sort of get through and get the basic idea. And, and there's something to be said for kind of speed reading to get a, a big overview, a big chunk of it. it at the same time, it's a study edition because with those footnotes at the bottom to say, here's what the word was in the original manuscript. And then it invites you to say, so what difference would that just changing one word make in how I understand this verse? Or what difference would it make in putting in a dash here or some, right. some commas? So it draws attention to the exact words. At the same time, it allows people to read fairly quickly. Yeah, and you mentioned the footnotes. Uh, Artis Partial, who writes at the Keep a Pitch and In blog, wrote a review of the book shortly after it came out. And one of the things she said at the beginning was, when I opened this up, I, I expected a lot more assistive things in the text. I look at the footnotes and actually felt disappointed. There seemed to be few footnotes here. But as she started looking into them, she saw this as a strength. Talk about the, the footnoting. So it's not a it's not a st- a study Book of Mormon in the way that a typical study Bible would be, which has a lot of footnotes. That's a project for for another day. In this version, there are fewer footnotes than in the standard version, and I think in some ways that's a strength because you'll get the feel pretty early on of what I footnote. So if somebody quotes something, you can go down and see where did that happen before. Or if there's a reference to an earlier event, you can look down at the bottom page and it'll tell you where that is. And then there's dates and some notes on chronology. And so those are pretty straightforward footnotes, not a lot of them, and then all the textual footnotes. And then there are several dozen footnotes where I give some representative examples of the kinds of things that you could see if you were reading carefully with some intertextuality where where significant phrases are picked up that were used earlier. I give several examples of something called inclusios where the same phrase will be used at the beginning and the end of a passage that will mark it off. And the passage could be shorter than a, a chapter or it might be several chapters. And I think that's a way that ancient authors used to signal some mileposts in the text to help the readers understand how these stories fit together. And one thing I noticed, too, is this is work that that you've done a lot of yourself, but that you've also been in collaboration with other readers who have helped you sort of notice some of these things. And one of these readers is your wife, Heather Hardy. I'm interested to hear about that dynamic and and what she brought to this text, because I I feel like her fingerprints are in there, and, and I'd like people to know about that. She is not going to want me to talk about oh, this okay. very much, but, but I will tell you, um, she reads through everything that I do very carefully, and most of those more interesting footnotes <laughs> came, came from, from <laughs> Heather's observations that she made. So she, she spends a lot of time reading the Book of Mormon, and, and then I, uh, this is, a, a, I guess, a family tradition. Every, every day for lunch, I call her up, and, and just to see how things are going. And sometimes we end up talking for half an hour or 45 minutes. It's great to be a professor and have, a, have some flexible yeah. time. And oftentimes it's about things she's noticed in the, in the Book of Mormon that, that morning. She reads it all the time. Yeah, Heather Hardy is an excellent reader. One of the things that you added to this book as well in the beginning is Emma Smith's testimony of Joseph Smith translating the Book of Mormon. So like the church's edition of the Book of Mormon, we have the testimony of witnesses who say they beheld the plates and you know, three of them saw the angel in the plates, eight of them saw the, the plates from which the Book of Mormon was translated. And to those witnesses, you add Emma Smith. Uh, talk about that decision. In the reader's edition, I put Emma Smith's testimony, and it's the famous interview that she did with her son, where she talks about how Joseph would dictate the manuscript and then take breaks and then come back to it without having things read back to him. Some of that will be And then familiar, the plates sure. were covered and, and yeah. Right. I put that at the end in an appendix along with some other statements by people who had, had been part of that process. But for the study edition, I put it up front with the three and eight witnesses because I find her testimony remarkable. And 
the testimonies of the three and eight witnesses take the form of they sound like legal affidavits maybe sure. they're they're written out and then all of them sign the thing and her testimony is so individualized and so personalized and she's not particularly intimidated by jo I, th I think she was better educated than joseph was and it seems like it, and yeah. and so she when she even say like he couldn't dictate a, will, a, a yeah, letter couldn't write a well <laughs> <laughs> he couldn't yeah, she said, write a letter miraculous yeah. to me yeah um and i think in in today's context that testimony might be more persuasive or, or persuasive in a different way than the three yeah. and the eight witnesses and it's also a way to to bring into the foreground a woman's testimony i love the book of mormon it is not a perfect book. One of the ways that I think it's deficient from a modern perspective is there there aren't enough women in it. I, when Nephi and Mormon were thinking about their future readers, apparently they didn't understand how much we would want to read about you know mothers and daughters and husbands and wives and 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 so to get another woman voice yeah. you know some somewhere in the foreground seemed like a good thing were you bothered at all it's it's some it's pretty removed from the from the translation itself it happens decades later what are your thoughts about that in terms of it's not a contemporary witness statement it's something that came after the fact it is and that's a problem with historical recollections you know long after these events have have passed but at the same time it is her voice and her words so it gives it some immediacy there's another great story from Mary Whitmer, uh, who's the mother of the Whitmer family, and she tells a story of how an angel came and showed her the plates at a time when she was tired and... and uh, she was keeping house was while, keeping they house while they were translating. Yeah, yeah, yeah doing exactly. all the work, exactly. <laughs> we wouldn't be tired and feeling a little unappreciated. Yeah. And it's a marvelous story, and we have two versions of that story told by her son and her grandson. And I didn't put those in the front because... It's, it's not her words. It's not her. It's a story. It, it is in the appendix. It's a story that we should know and we should celebrate, but it lacks that uh, immediacy. immediacy. Yeah. Even though, as you say, in Emma's case, that it's not at the same time, but it's things that she experienced. And, and I think maybe that's something that a lot of people don't appreciate is Emma was Joseph's first scribe. And she may have done a considerable amount of the lost 116, 116 yeah. pages. I mean, right. she's really important. In the, well, and she was with Joseph when he went to the hill to, to, get, to, the plates. Get, to actually take possession of the plates. So she's in this story from the very beginning. And so it seems like she deserves a little more Yeah, And, and basically, you know, and, and became in some ways alienated from her own family over the relationship with joseph and well and then become came alienated from the utah church yeah, and from yeah. brigham and i think yeah. that's part of the reason that we haven't really embraced right. her right it, but I, a lot of time has passed yeah <laughs> sure. and you see a little I bit of emma so. resurgence you see emma in art now the the yeah. film jane and emma is fantastic but i think you're right that that emma in some ways faded for those for those reasons in some ways yeah i love the kind of homely detail of her feeling them through the cloth, kind of thumbing through pages that this is this is a material other than what we have generally imagined of I mean we call them gold plates, but they were are golden yeah. appearance. Right, they right. Were, they're there's something yeah. There's, anyway, that, that was just a puzzling, peculiar, and she included very it. visceral Yeah, detail. it's a tactile how thing. That, yeah, how the, yeah, how the pages. So I think through. about that all the time because I feel like that's how I approach the Book of Mormon. But instead of the cloth over the plates, this is dealing with the English translation. I can sort of feel what's going yeah. on back there, but I don't have the direct access. The other story that I like is where she says that, yeah, the plates were around and she used to move in when she dusted. And yeah. it, it seems like yeah. a very mundane kind yeah. of, she, she, she just accepts them for, yeah. for, for what they are. Yeah. That's Grant Hardy. He's a professor of history and religious studies at the University of North Carolina at Asheville. He edited the Maxwell Institute study edition of the Book of Mormon. He's also written a book called Understanding the Book of Mormon, a reader's guide from Oxford University Press. He's done other work in Chinese history, ancient historiography, and studies of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And we're also talking with Brian Kershisnik, who's an American painter and artist who did woodcut illuminations for this. And we'll talk about why we use that term illuminations. But I wanted to say, Grant mentioned women in the Book of Mormon, and there aren't many in there. And one of the questions I've heard from people is the woodcuts themselves, there aren't a lot of women in those. So let's start by talking about, about that aspect of things. Right. Well, I mean, I always feel like images associated with scripture need to be subservient to the words. 
And so because there is generally one image per book or major authorship, so in two of the books there are actually two images, an Alma and Mormon. I believe it is. Yes, yeah. mm-hmm. the last two chapters of Mormon were by Moroni. By Moroni. So you you want to come up with an image that is emblematic of the whole book, and so it, my my approach was to include women where I where I could without being irresponsible with the text, because the text itself it doesn't mention women a lot. But for example. When Alma's baptizing, he baptized men and women, and so I chose to have him baptizing a woman in that image. There was an early decision, because initially these images were going to be very small, to focus mostly on hands. There was a set of drawings that was that was always just hands, focusing in on hands. That solved the problem of not trying to decide what fashion the, <laughs> the clothing these was. people were wearing. We have no idea, you know, what, what their clothes looked like, but... And so in the in third Nephi, when everyone went for it to feel the wounds in Christ's hands, the women would of course do that too. It's a, it's a little trickier to indicate whether these are masculine or feminine hands. But in my mind, that's the hands of a young woman. And then there's also one so. in the Helaman uh, woodcut as well, looking down into the right the, the angels yeah. that that in the pillar of fire, mm-hmm. and uh, so, and whenever I depict angels, I. It's either a mixture of men and women, and so it just seemed it, because that was not it was not indicated otherwise. I I, I was presumptuous enough to suggest that one of those visitors well, was one a of the things that I love in your in your illuminations, your woodcuts, is how many of them show the process of either reading or writing, which goes really well with my work because I try to focus on the narrators and what they're trying to do. But reading and writing is not a gendered thing. Well, it probably was in the ancient world, but in our world, it's it's no. it's not a gendered thing. Like, right, some of the warfare is going to be clearly gendered. And, sure. But I, I like the fact that I hope that's something that women could look at that and then think about their own writings and, mm. and, and recordings of sacred experiences and how they would do that and what, what that would mean to posterity to, to others. Yeah, the text that I put in the woodcuts is invented, random markings. The, the script, you yeah, mean? The, on the, the script, yeah. 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 Uh, uh, partially because it's I It's not the real Reformed Egyptian? <laughs> I thought that you... Be, and, and I admit that partially that's because these were going to be very small and that was going to be impossible to see any <laughs> yeah, of it. Yeah. Right. Because they're printed quite large, you can see uh, some of that text and I don't have access to the uh, Reformed okay. Egyptian alphabet. Well, I'm Actually, sh- there are examples of it. Didn't uh, Martin Harris say yeah, some yeah, yeah. But I didn't refer to those because I didn't think it was going to be legible. But well, even that like character's document is sort of questioned as in terms of its authenticity. And, hmm. yeah. I'm, I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about the process of, of how these, these illuminations came about. But the origin was there was an a edition of the Bible that I am quite fond of. This is the HarperCollins Standard Edition of the New Revised Version. N-R- New Revised Standard, Standard Version. version. Yeah. I have to get it right. The NRSV. Um, <laughs> and in this edition, which is really nicely done, there's, uh, it has sort of a ragged right margin in full mm. page lines. And in this edition, at the beginning of every book, is a small woodcut. And it's right. maybe... Two inches by two inches, yeah. some, something like that. Just Even maybe three, a, three by two or something. Like. Oh, they're, they're, they're pretty small. And that's what I had in mind when we yeah. started. And, that's and they're what very we, basic. It would be like oh, a, yeah, no, a they're, leaf. They're, and right. A, they're sort of very abstract. A horn. And, right. and, a, yeah. and I don't think there are any people I'm pretty in sure them. that there's not. I think not, they're just yeah. some objects. A crown. And some, yeah. Or I, I, a pair of scales for yeah. the book of Judges. Right. And, that right. Sort of, so, right. and I thought, oh, that's really lovely. We should do something like that. And you stuck some clip art in. the Yeah. Yeah. To some of the... Yeah, some clip art, and then some of them were just taken from that edition. Yeah. So, oh, something, do something like this. <laughs> and when when Brian started sending drawings, they tended to be about people, which I think is something that you... Which is what I do. Right. Yeah, and, uh, all, and they, all of my work, and, essentially. And they were really lovely. And we said, these can't be two by two. Like, we need to give these yeah. more space <laughs> yeah. so that you can... So they ended up being actually full page yeah. illuminations. And that's when <laughs> the, the script becomes legible. The script becomes legible. <laughs> or not legible, but it, you can yeah. see something. Yeah. Like that. so did, would... Brian, one thing that we did too, Grant just said... Grant didn't say, okay, I want this for this book. I want this for this book. I want this for this book. He said, we're doing probably about one of each for each book. And then 
go at it. How, what was your process then? Just reading the book and making notes and sketches. And uh, generally, I don't approach the project by envisioning it and then executing it. I execute it and then <laughs> envision it. <laughs> and explain why you did yeah, what you did. <laughs> and try to figure out if I like it or not. And um, so I'm, I'm not, not as a scholar, but I was someone who has studied the Book of Mormon for almost as long as I have been able to read. I'm familiar with the story, so it, it was. But it was interesting to say, okay, I have one image for this book. What is it? And my my feeling is always to draw the reader into the words. The words are the primary experience, and the the images are a nice design break and such. But hopefully, to maybe suggest something about the words, but not to replace the words. Or I, we have we have the idea of the size of the Liahona. I think probably from uh, Freeberg's image. The, right. about, it's a grapefruit size, and that image persists for me, probably from his images. Minerva Teichert's, it's more of a basketball size. Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. And the fact of the matter is we have no idea. Yeah. How, I mean, yeah, it, was it, was port portable. Portable, right. it was portable. It was portable. It was portable. We do have Maybe they idea. rolled it. Maybe it was like... <laughs> like BB-8. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> I, I was just, uh, as I am in my own work, was fairly playful and in some of the early sketches that i drew talk about the, the deleted scenes yeah, there yeah. Was, there, it, it was apparent and one of the reasons i'm involved in this is because of the respect that i have for grant and his work and there was some pushback with the, there are there were a lot of fairly martial yeah. images it's um, a war book in a lot and, of ways and my perception of what you were saying is yeah that has gotten already gotten a lot of attention L let's focus on some other things and i think i think that that was sensible, but because there was some pushback on the martial images, I I kind of let fly, you know, <laughs> shiz, uh, decapitated shiz, you know, <laughs> gasping for air, and I mean some pretty horrific, gross <laughs> Ammon cutting arms off and right. surprised I... <laughs> Lamanites, you know, as their arms are being severed. I mean, some of that was, I mean, that's kind of gross, but. <laughs> But uh, that was just being a little bit grossly playful. With but Grant. but there are some military images because there are yep. because Alma, yeah. Well, at, at one point there was it looked like kind of a running joke that you would have the the a similar image with guys with spears, right. and then there would be more guys more, yeah. with more spears, to say, and then the next time there would be even a more ton, guys right? with more spears. Yeah. Towards and the end <laughs> of the book, yeah. The, the, the fr I yeah. can't remember where, we, where initial in the initial proposal, it, and it was exactly it was exactly that, <laughs> yeah. that there was war and. Just wait. There was more war, yep. and in the end, there was even well, we, more. Well, we still got that. I think Jerem and uh -huh. and uh, yeah, I believe the, there are two. The last, yeah. the last half of uh, uh, Alma. Alma. We've got that, two of those right. images, and that last half of Alma image was actually done for the conclusion of the book for yeah. for the the last war. So we just when we decided to split up Alma into two images, I brought that. Back. We should talk about that. So we split up Alma into two images because. First of all, it didn't seem fair that that Jerem got an image and you know sixty three <laughs> chapters yeah. of Alma got one image. That's part. Of it. But also, there's a a break in Alma forty five where Alma hands over the records to his son Helaman, and then yep. and then Helaman takes over. So it's there's a record a, transfer. Yeah. So there's yeah. even though it's one book, there's a there's a an important transfer that happens there. And so to kind of mark that, so that people have that in mind as they're mm. reading, the first image is of a seedling. Mm -hmm. the, that, Alma 32, yeah, the which is a, seed, yeah. And, and so much of the first part of Alma is about, you know, missionary work and about sermons and about nurturing faith and, and trying to help people see the truth and convert. But 45 on is mostly war. So, yeah. so it, that made sense, I think, to, to do those two. Well, and I was glad we didn't do an image for every author shift in Omni. You know, just, <laughs> we just have a, a page or so to have, I think, five authors. All of yeah, the author yeah. shifts, yeah. <laughs> they all get their own picture. Well, my favorite one is the, the one of the lost, from the 116 pages, which is the blank page at the very beginning of the book. People <laughs> oh. don't know that, but that's that's right. the most interesting woodcut, right. was just the blank page. And interestingly, speaking of lost pages, I, I lost all of the final drawings that I did for the woodcuts. Fortunately, I had scanned them, so I had the information I needed for the woodcuts, but uh, I, they slid out of my bag on an airplane with my iPad, and I noticed that my iPad was missing and was able to retrieve it, but they but never got the drawings back, so... 
They're out there somewhere. The so lost it's, pages. Yeah, so, so you can feel a, a kinship with Joseph Smith. Yeah. And then the, yeah, when the Brian returned and told me that those pages were lost, I was so <laughs> mad. Yeah. Another thing I wanted to ask, too, was about the cover image, how the cover image came together. Well, that image was cut at least three times and possibly more. Uh, we decided in designing the book, there were two horizontal images at the beginning and at the end. And mm -hmm. so this, that, the cover image was actually uh, done as the title page image. And because it was horizontal, I decided to crop it somewhat oddly. I, I have feelings about, I, I certainly have done images of Jesus in my life, but I feel like too much attention is given to getting a picture that looks like he actually looks. And, and I feel like the way we get to know Jesus is working with him, you know, not by getting, not by finding the artist that makes the most accurate picture. Yeah. We don't have like a contemplative tradition where we have an icon of Christ and like, right. Meditate on that. So, yeah. um, and, and so the, the sheep are, uh, the, the, they're us. I, I, I suppose that I was interested in kind of our engagement with Jesus. I didn't, I chose not to to his face. And so there was Jesus holding sheep it, it, from the scripture about other sheep I have. Yeah, but as you say, and the other sheep I have sort of refers to the Nephites. Yeah. But there is a sense in which we're all we his, are, his yeah. sheep. It, it, it's, a, it's a broader image, I yeah, think. Yeah, he's has the good shepherd broader. and we are the sheep. And so because these images are in black and white, I don't know why it didn't occur to me early on to use a black sheep. I, I mean, just, just for... For design reasons, it's mm -hmm. it's superior, but so in the initial ones, I I did have some black sheep in the crowd, but he was holding a white sheep and he's in a white robe. And my recollection, Blair, is I heard from you yeah. about making the suggestion. This was really hard because you had done all the work. We you were pretty much done with the carving part of yeah. it. And and also, let's take a minute to explain that in a minute. But but I knew that was done. And I, my wife and I were driving up to Logan, and I'm listening to a radio interview with LaShawn Williams, who teaches at UVU. She's a Latter-day Saint. She's a black member of the church. And she mentioned in an interview how she was sitting in church once and saw this image of Christ holding a black sheep. I'm pretty sure it was the Minerva Tykert, Christ in a red robe, where he's holding right. a black yeah, sheep. Right. And she said to that point in her life, she can never remember seeing Christ with a black sheep like that. And that in that moment, sitting in that room, she identified so closely with that sheep she saw herself presented in in a church meeting this way and it, i got my phone out right then and, and started writing this email to you and grant and i think morgan and said hey this may be way out there because we're really far along in the project but just maybe think about this and everybody just said oh that that makes complete sense well it, it was the, uh, there were a couple of things one is just graphically it it was going to work better Oh yeah, it, graphically the it was going to work better. Yeah. And the other thing was, in the previous two cuttings, a lot depended on the look on that lamb's face, and neither of them, the previous ones, was I satisfied with. I was going to recut just the head. Hmm. To I mean, it would have been a, a nightmare to print. So when you suggested, what if, about him holding a black sheep? I thought, you know, I'm just going to recut this block it, it it needs it i mean it's very similar in many ways to the other ones that i'd cut so i'd had some practice and there was a cool moment too when faith came in and you were about to cut the or you were drawing the eyes do you remember that no remember. yeah she says she says oh cat eyes yeah. go this way yeah. sheep eyes go this way yeah, she reminded me the yeah. pupils are kind yeah. of horizontal yeah yeah oh and faith was a great help but you should explain who faith is faith yeah is faith. my wife yeah. yeah and she's an artist as well and, yeah. and so she was she was making suggestions all along that was she, she actually has a better memory of details like that yeah and so um so there was some discussion about using the black sheep of course there's the minerva tykert image that you mentioned there are a couple of reasons why that ended up being a really good idea. I love that that shepherds use their color sheep. It's not. It is not a, a different breed or different race among sheep. It's just it turns up about every hundred births. There's color in the sheep, and so they use those. If they have seven hundred sheep, when they're bringing their sheep in, they just count seven dark ones, and they know they've got their herd. And and it just seemed like a beautiful metaphor for you can gauge the health of your herd by keeping track of the, the few, that, yeah. that minority you yeah. know and anyway and, and and it just seemed like and there's also of course the idea of the black sheep of the family referring to kind of the outsider and yeah. which might have there might have been some resistance to that but the 
decision in the end was that that is inclusive, that Jesus holding the black sheep means you too. If you, if you feel excluded for some reason, no, this is, this is. It centralizes yeah. those who feel excluded. Yeah. Wh whatever the color of your skin. Yeah. We're all black sheep in some way. Isaiah says, all we like sheep have gone astray. Yeah. It can see. Yeah. That's what I liked is it can function on all these levels. There's yeah. no, this is what you mean too by, by illumination too, right? How is that different from illustration? Uh, it's, it's probably just me being a knucklehead, but, um, <laughs> Part of it is that you want to shed light without invading too much. Illustration feels to me, the word feels to me like you're doing too much of the work for people. A careful, good, deep reading of any text, let alone a religious text, involves a huge amount of imagination and take yours into the text. And I think that there is a tendency to kind of want someone else to do that work for you. And so illumination kind of implies that you're shedding a little bit of light on a possibility. Illustration, the word just suggests to me that you're kind of, this is what it looked like. And yeah, I mean, I, certainly the image I had growing up my whole life was of Nephites going into battle in Roman armor, yeah. you know, because of, sure. yeah, because yeah. of uh, Freeberg's uh, kind of amazing illustrations, but they, they kind of defined what stuff looks like. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the problem then is that if we don't then ask the question, it's, it's fine to put them in Roman armor. That's fine. But it, we also at some point need to ask ourselves a question. Is that, is that likely what they were wearing? It, and so anyway, I decided to pull back a little bit from suggesting details and just try to shed some light. Yeah. I, I think of it illumination as something to ponder and something to sort of draw out thought as opposed to just to show show something and to give thought to like yeah. say what it is. Well, I, I like them and I grew up with the Freeburg images as well. It sort of informed yeah. my I, imagination. They're in every copy of the Book of Mormon Absolutely. that the church prints still. But, so yeah. But I like the woodcuts that you've done because they're they're a little softer. They're not hyper masculinized the the way that Freebergs are and they're they're more suggestive. They're they're a little less explicit and I think that that allows people to, as you say, to sort of fill in the gaps or to imagine them themselves a little more. The medium lends itself to that. It's black and white. There's not a sense of, you know, this is a, a photograph of that, right. of that circumstance. And so there, there are elements of the image and the way I make images that are a little bit surreal. So th they, they don't suggest that they're replacing an actual vision. They are suggesting what someone thought of. I, I feel like I return to a kind of the sadness of the authors, partially just, I mean, that, that's, a, that's me imposing my own mm -hmm. feeling about what Mormon is feeling when he's writing or what Mormon. No, no, it's not. No, that's, that's, <laughs> that's what the, the this is what the, and, and they go nicely, I think, with my editing, where I tried to bring out the narrators without putting a lot of my ideas about right. what the text means. The Book of Mormon is a tragedy. It is it, a it, tragedy. People die. The civilization, yeah. Yeah. like, is, and, and that comes through in the, your in, images. In yeah. the woods, weeping. Yeah. Riding on a stump. Yeah. You know, Bereft I, mean, I, of... I, I just, I, I, my heart breaks for, for lonely Moroni, you know, his, his life did not end happily, no. you know, the book of Mormon ends, uh, <laughs> it sort of ends on a low note, but a promise of good things to come with a promise <laughs> of good are, things to come. People Grant who knows. didn't see the promises fulfilled so, yeah. in their own life, but, but so, we're but now we're passing it to you. It. Saw them yes. afar off. See, yes. yeah, see, that's Grant Hardy. That's why we bring Grant Hardy to the interview today. <laughs> that's why you're here. No, that's, that's in Hebrew. It yes. talks about yes. that, sort of, that sort of faith. Yes, we're talking with Grant Hardy and Brian Kershisnik. Brian, I challenge you in about 60 seconds to describe from beginning to end the process of creating that print, can, each of these prints, the actual process of what you do. Okay, so there's you do a lot of drawings. You decide which are the best ones. You show them to other trusted people around you involved with the project. You hone down the best image. You do a few drawings of that too to, to get it contained, graphically strong. And then that is traced and reversed because it has to be reversed onto a block. The block has been prepared and sanded and toned. That It is transferred onto the block with a, a transfer paper, that drawing is strengthened with a Sharpie. Yeah, so the transfer paper is like this sort of very onion skin type paper that you put on there. And yeah. when you draw on it, it leaves this blue, a blue line. line. And when then you, you trace that with Sharpie. With Sharpie yeah. and, and make any adjustments you want to there. And then you get the knife and you breathe in through the nose and out through the mouth and start cutting away wood. And the first, the first cuts are always the, 
the trickiest, but then you just get in the zone and cut away. And then the block is done, and then what? Then the block has to be proofed, so it's sent to, sent to the printer, and he prints it, and it comes back to me. He basically puts ink on it, right? Yeah. Like inks it, it. Rolls ink, runs it through a press that presses it into the paper, and that shows you parts of aspects of the drawing that you hadn't noticed. Mm -hmm. And so then you either have to start from scratch again, or you adjust or amend the block and send it back for proofing. At, usually, at least at, that happens at least twice before we're good to go. I think that was 60 seconds. It's, it's, <laughs> it's pretty close. And if it wasn't, delete my insertions because that was that was really good. Well done. It was a, gr a great privilege to see at different stages, those kind of come into existence, and I would say there was a there were a lot there were conversations with Grant on email with you, yeah. Blair, and uh, with, and Morgan, with Morgan yeah. Davis, and with my wife, of course, my son uh, helped do a lot of the ins the delegatable carving. I yeah. call it like if there are just a lot of horizontals in the background, mm -hmm. then. Then I could turn that over to my son, yeah. who helped me with a lot of that. He make he made a makes father and son carving. Yes, that's right. That's together, right. working yeah. on scripture. Yeah. Yes. He made that's some it. decisions about the shapes of those letters. You know, I would say ah, I yes. just need this filled with the text. <laughs> I've never worked on a project like this before with an artist, and it and it was. I have an idea about how much work goes into editing and and writing and rewriting but to see that from the, the visual perspective was just a lot of fun and yeah. we did a lot of drawings early on and i gave some suggestions he had mm -hmm. suggestions for each of the books but it made me think about the text in different ways like in the Good. early early drawings these are stuff that didn't make it in the fun but you had you had it's in helaman where where samuel the lamanite but instead of having him on the wall, you have him, I think, climbing up the wall. Yeah, I said, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. How would he have gotten up yeah. there? That's something I'd never thought about before in the deck. So they're just yeah. all kinds of little, right. you brought a, a unique perspective to these stories as you tried to visualize them. And, and part of just the way I approach imagery is to try to look at it very, very personally. I mean, for example, in the third Nephi image, which is possibly the, well, I, I think it's possibly the most intimate image Mm -hmm. And it's just hands with their thumb in the wound, you know, Jesus Christ's wound. And and to kind of feel like, okay, I'm next I'm next in line, you know, that this is this is happening right in front of me and I'm I'm about to do that. It just it helped me to kind of imagine myself there. And like you say, to imagine, well, he got up on the wall, he wasn't welcome in the city. I imagine <laughs> He yeah, climbed up, but so, I, had yeah. to show, I had to show what, what kind of clothes he would be wearing to do that, so I ended up not utilizing that image. But. Do you have a favorite one? Is there, Brian, is there an image that you sort of could, could meditate on or that you feel connected to? You know, I have this connection to Moroni the, at the end of the book. I mentioned that, that kind of that sad image of him uh, kind of alone and crying and, and writing. And I don't know why that is. It, it, I I put him in woods, you know. That I'm making some assumptions in doing so. But he was in he was in the wilderness and fleeing. And there is there is a, we mentioned it a little bit earlier. But there is this that as an aspect of discipleship in the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is maintaining a certain optimism, notwithstanding the details of the present are very bleak you know i feel like jesus says i will not leave you comfortless uh that that word is orphans you know i won't leave you orphans kind of the flip side of that sentence is you're gonna feel like orphans mm -hmm. and yeah. and just remember that i'm coming after you you know and and there's some aspect of of moroni's discipleship it it never feels to me like he is a general like his father was a general I mean, he was a he was a leader, and he was a, he was a good man, and he was a smart man, and put into a position of authority. But it, he he just feels to me like one of the people in the book that is approachable. That and and my heart breaks for him, and so I I, I return to that image often. How about you, Grant? Any image for you? Some of the images are things that people would expect. So, for example, it, for First Nephi, we thought about a tree of life, but that's mm -hmm. been done a lot. And instead, we did the Leahona. But still, that, that's something that I think makes sense to, to uh, will make sense to most readers. And in Ether, sort of, you know, touching of the stones is a classic image. There's one image that's not so expected. And in this editing, including in the, the images, I, I was hoping that we could bring out things that were in the text 
to highlight the work of the narrators. But there's one uh, woodcut where I'm pushing back a little bit against the the narrator. That's in, that's in Helaman. Because I think that Helaman 5 is one of the most important chapters in the Book of Mormon, and I think Mormon underplays it. Hmm. So we're going to give a little more emphasis. So this is the image of, of Nephi and Lehi, the later Nephi and Lehi, who are in the prison, and then the fire comes, the flames, and the angels look down. It's an extraordinary experience that... It, um, Samuel the Lamanite would have been great as well, but I but I really like mm. like this one. It's an extraordinary experience for them. It has extraordinary political implications because the Lamanites who are part of that experience actually go as missionaries to to the Lamanites and they convert a lot of them and then the Lamanites give back half of the land that they had taken from the I mean you've seen chapters and chapters of all this war with mm -hmm. Captain Moroni and that's what we focus on and apparently Mormon wasn't that but he said no that's that's more amazing they just give back this land yeah. and then later on when Christ comes when when the savior visits the nephites he says he talks about a baptism with fire and he said that's what happened to the lamanites in the prison once so he actually thinks that's a really so it's not just me he trying liked, to push yeah. back you get, like Jesus liked that chapter yeah. too. But so, I have to say, Grant, too, he also said, Where Samuel the Lamanite? Oh, that's you leave true. Him that, out, that, so. that would have worked as well. You've got to be okay, careful now. To two in, but this was a really Maybe, hard yeah. challenge, was to come up with just was one image yeah, that's was going to yeah. represent. But in that case, because it's a little less yeah. expected, because Arnold Freeberg didn't do that right. that particular yeah, right. image. He did Samuel. He did him up on the wall. So, yeah. He did. So, so yeah. I, I, I'm quite fond. And also, it's just so nicely done with yeah. the angels looking on in a way that is it seems like classic sort of kershiznik art a little bit well and, and i also mentioned that leaving them as silhouettes mm -hmm. was uh, which i i think worked really beautifully that was uh, i was i had them drawn in as you saw in mm -hmm. certain uh, previous iterations the one had a beard one yeah. didn't yeah, yeah i remember but it was faith's idea to leave them as silhouettes which i thought was really great she she kind of made, made a lot of suggestions while working on that particular image yeah i, I think i think mine the one that there are two that are sort of burned in my mind, and I, I had a picture of it as my desktop wallpaper for a while, but it's Jesus touching the stones and making them light is a beautiful image. And the, and the other one is Enos praying and in this posture of, of exhausted supplication. And there's this urgent exhaustion to that image that you don't often see, I think. Can, can you talk more about that image? Because you did a lot of different lot drafts of, yeah. of uh, some of them it was close sort of from a distance and, you could see yeah, his yeah. whole and some of them was very close up yeah. and what what made you decide on the final image I, that I don't think I have a good answer uh, I, I well I think it was a formal decision ultimately that I just I felt like that was strong mm -hmm. uh, translating the image into two colors you know there were there was just some some logistical reasons uh, so I would just look at the four or five or six drawings and say, yeah, I like this one. But you know what they all had in common was rather than rather than Enos in sort of a typical kneeling prayer mm. position for modern yeah, Latter-day right, Saints, exactly. he was prostrate. I mean, exactly. He's, he's yeah, on yeah. the ground. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I say and this I'd, exhausted supplication yeah. that, that yeah. you know, typically we see pictures of people sitting and folding their arms with their head bowed right. in, in prayer, right? And, and that's a fairly scrubbed notion of of when you really are in extremis before yeah. God, you know? Yeah. I mean, in my own experience, that, yeah. that scrubbed image of kneeling and folding your arms and bowing your head, that, that happens often and that's good. But but Enos was, the, the, the universe was changing for Enos. And so I, I put it, yeah, I put, had him down. Yeah. Well, and he's also, of course, this is a story, but it's also a nighttime yeah. image as he yeah. speaks yeah. about about the wrestle the, that he had yeah uh, but a, yeah. a process that takes all night, all night yeah, yeah, through yeah the all night, night yeah. These, yeah. yeah we we just get a little scrap of that conversation that went on and on and on and on as he's pleading and trying to understand and remembering and and yeah the i don't have i don't have the sense that that was a big repentance time for him i i suspect he was a good guy but it just it all was everything was kind of coming together his calling is his missions, it was getting serious for him. And and it's so beautiful, too, that immediately he starts worrying about, ah, what about the Lamanites? What, what about? And immediately starts worrying about the others. Yeah. You know? I think that's a beautiful 
beautiful book. See, and I wonder if, if this is similar to other art you do, because you know people that are familiar with the art of Branker Shisnik have seen some whimsical images, some poignant images. There, you know, pictures of dogs dancing or people jugglers juggling joyful scenes sad scenes and these are scenes that are from a text that you believe in and that you you are nourished by was it different to create art for that purpose or do you see similarities between the other pieces that you do i try even in the whimsical funny pieces i i try to make my livelihood worshipful i mean i i feel like if the images are funny this has to be someone I'm laughing with, not someone I'm laughing at. And I also believe very strongly that God laughs. I mean, I, I feel like I've heard that, la that yeah. laughter a few times, <laughs> but it was, I, I, I tried to relax. I mean, the, part of the problem is because it's scripture, because I believe it's holy, there's, it, it, there's kind of a tendency to want, as I mentioned, to use, I use the word to scrub it up, to neaten it up. And, and I thought, no, this, this all happened to human human beings and i'm a human being approach this as a human being god loves human beings and so there were some i mentioned earlier some fairly whimsical violent drawings <laughs> my my initial work as a child was generally very violent <laughs> drawings <laughs> you know i don't i don't have many of those left <laughs> I, I, I haven't been doing violent drawings for a long time but but i do actually from time to time do paintings of war Mm -hmm. uh, partially because of the emotions that that brings up in those big in the painting or the woodcut of all of those faces you know i i see i see fear i see determination i see sorrow for enemies and sorrow for self i mean there's all of these emotions that i would imagine would accompany a mass of people going into war and you mentioned worship being involved in not just the process of creating these for the Book of Mormon, but also the art that you do. And there's sort of a mantra that we have at the Maxwell Institute. It's something that Elder Neil A. Maxwell once said that that for a disciple, scholar, academic research can be a form of worship. So it sounds as though art for the artist can likewise be a form of worship a disciple artist yeah it, it, it's a little tricky because uh the whole idea of priestcraft <laughs> comes yeah. into play yeah. you know that you're that, making well paul said the laborer is worthy of his hire well too, thank though. you paul. so but, yeah <laughs> but I, I um that doesn't simplify the task yeah. I, I mean i try right. i i try to approach the work worshipfully yeah but i also need to sell it to buy my groceries yeah. and and i don't want to, i don't ever want to go up to the easel and say i have a mortgage payment and Paintings of Jesus are doing really well. Yeah, I mean, I don't want that trendy. To, yeah, yeah, I don't want to be <laughs> they're trending right now. I don't want that ever to be the motivation for me to do, uh, you know, to include the Lord in my imagery. But it, I, a good day at the studio is is a worshipful day. And there and the sleeves are rolled up and you're messy. Yeah, and it dirty. can include sweat and laughter. And, yeah, and yeah, tears <laughs> and uh, you know, it, yeah. it's, it's not all neat. It's not all the picturesque part. But there is, uh, yeah. I, I I came home one day from work and 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 my wife said, "So uh, how was your day?" And I said, "Ah, oh, God was with me today." And she said, "Oh, that's where he was." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What about you, Grant? So the the same question: the idea of being a disciple scholar and working on the Book of Mormon. What what are your thoughts about that? As your work as as being an act of worship. It's a lovely quote that you read from, or maybe you have it memorized from. I've, from I've said it quite often, yeah. <laughs> Elder Maxwell. Um, and and the, the religious community that to me sort of best illustrates that is the Jewish community, where there's ideas of, of studying Torah. And of course, that's, you know, what you should do on the Sabbath. And I think there's even a, a notion of God himself studies Talmud three hours a day, or there's all kinds of, but a sense that, that um, scholarship and serious scholarship, looking at languages and comparing texts and things is a, is a way to get closer to God, partly because so much of that is directed toward the Word of God. And I feel that when I study the Book of Mormon and other, other scriptures, some people are more sure than I am about revelation and about, you know, they're sure that God tells them to do things. And I've, I've felt inspiration in my life, but there have been times in my life where that has been a little bit harder. And, and at those times, it would have been really convenient to have them. And you're doing yeah. what you feel like you need to get it. Yeah, that's right. not always when it comes. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. But, but I feel 
a consistency when I read scripture that this is a, a way that God has chosen to make himself manifest to me, but to everyone. It's a, and the more seriously we take that, and, and I include things like, oh, we should be learning Greek. We should be learning Hebrew. We should be doing this as, as, as carefully and as with as many tools as we have, not just sort of reading them and thinking about how we feel, but actually doing hard scholarship with manuscripts and, and verb conjugations. I feel like God is pleased when we give that much attention to his word. And I, I feel that maybe I particularly respond to text, but I also feel the spirit consistently with music. Mm. And, and I think that's a feeling that many people, people have, that there's something that, that comes in those experiences, maybe not all the time, but, but fairly consistently. So for, for me, studying in, in very academic ways actually feels at least it feels like me reaching up and 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 sometimes that's that's responded to from above and this is what i've found in talking i'm blessed to be able to as part of my job sit down with people like you and talk about the work that you do and think about the work that people do in the vein of worship and and what strikes me and what you said grant too is that all of those things you described aren't just solitary pursuits. You can make them pretty solitary in some ways. You can cloister yourself off and, and study something. Oh, but they're not as much fun. They're not as much fun. In, in, and, in Judaism, yes. you have to have a study partner right. in order to, to, to make this. With. Yes. Well, <laughs> See, to this argue is, with. Yeah, and this is just is... it. Yeah, that's what I'm saying is like worship. It's not just worship in terms of like shouting hallelujah or something like this. But I think some of my most edifying moments of worship come in relationship with other people. And when I'm reading a book, I'm with that author when, and, and with everybody that that author was with when they were putting that together, when I'm looking at a painting or at a, at a woodcut, I'm looking, I'm, I'm with that person who created it and with the people who were there that, that I might not even know about, like your son and faith adding to the things that you're doing. And, and so I feel like academic worship and art and these other things, they're acts of worship because they also open our hearts to each other and they require an openness. So for me, working at a university hasn't made me feel this idea of like being prideful and like being better than other people and the sort of elitist, you know, I'm sure I can, I'm sure I act elitist sometimes and whatnot. <laughs> But more than that, it has it has been a, a humbling experience and ma and made me less sure about everything that I thought I was sure about in a good way because then I have to listen to other people. Well, to, to return to the Jewish tradition, when you're studying Torah, there's commentaries, there's tons of commentaries, and it's an invitation to be part of a community. People have been arguing about this, trying to see things in it, trying to interpret it. For thousands of, so a, a decent commentary will say, you know, Rashi said this, or Maimonides said this, and then there's a challenge to say, can you add something to this comment? Like this very smart, very devout people have been doing this commentary for so long, and we're just starting that as right. Latter-day Saints with our own scriptures. And, and in this case, I was working with people in the Maxwell Institute and of course with Heather and sort of back and forth and on the, many of these. The Religious Studies Center the Religious and, Studies Desiree Center Book. and Desiree Book yeah. sort of came in a, yeah. a little later, later but, on, yeah. but in the earlier process, just lots of conversations and then having an artistic perspective in, to bring that into these conversations was just a delight yeah. and a joy as well. There's a, a Rumi poem that um, Faith says that I misquote. It, well, that, that I misinterpret, but she, she thinks that Rumi would not disapprove, but, <laughs> but it, there's this hierarchy of communion with God and it, the, the first one is prayer and the next one up is meditation. And then the higher one is conversation, which, which she thinks is referring to conversation with God. Mm -hmm. But, but I think n no ideas come to me yeah. almost in, in a certain particular and poignant way when I'm talking to people about mm -hmm. the things I've been praying about, about the yeah. things I've been reading about. And then I talk, yeah, I, I really think that that is a beautiful way of looking at scripture, that even if we're reading it alone, we're with the author. Yeah. We're with everyone else who Yeah, but you're hardly the, ever reading scripture alone because no. that's to, to come full circle to your first question about what is, what is scripture? What is scripture, yeah. It's something, it's a, it's a text that's read by a community yeah. who values it. Right. And so we're all reading, we're all dealing with pretty much the same words here, but people are bringing different 
experiences, different sensibilities, different perceptions to it. And that's a that's something that binds us together as a as a as a community, as a faith community. I have a memory on my mission when when testimony of the Book of Mormon was upgraded significantly. But I remember reading in Ether twelve, and we have of course the scripture we quote all the time about weaknesses that I I believe I maintain we misquote. But so Moroni is proofreading. And he's saying to God, uh, the <laughs> Gentiles are going to laugh at this. Yeah. You know, he, he's, in other words, he's saying, ah, this is really bad. This is weak. Yeah. What, I, what I've been looking at, Brother Jared, he could write, but we yeah. can't write. You know, and We don't have Brother Jared's writings, right? So, so Moroni is, and, and all this time when I'm reading it, I'm thinking, no, no, Moroni, you're doing great. I mean, I'm really feeling it and, and comforting him. And, and God comes in and talks back to him and essentially says, yeah, yeah, ouch, huh, Morona? I mean, he says, yeah, fools mock, but they'll mourn. And, you know, if, if people will humble themselves, then they won't take advantage of your weakness. God is actually acknowledging to Moroni. I, I mean, I'm doing some paraphrasing here, you understand, of course, but uh, acknowledging, yeah, there are problems. But if people will come with faith and an, an acknowledgement of their own weakness, then weak things, I maintain, he's talking about the book, will become strong unto them. Yeah. And, and I just remember... I mean, when you were talking about kind of a communication with the author, I remember that experience very poignantly. And I'm talking to him, encouraging him. No, it's really good. It's really, really so, good. But one of the things that comes that I try to bring out in this edition is Moroni has this task of finishing up his father's history. <laughs> and he feels intimidated and oh. inadequate to that. And he actually ends up making three different attempts like yeah. he, he ends it three Very, times he says yeah. okay that's it and then he it's keeps like the lord of the rings like, movie where <laughs> like there was like five endings and you're like no, okay it's, it's, uh, it's it, well it's hard to know yeah. like because it, obviously it means uh, so much to him and and i'm still alive so uh, I, I, I guess yeah. i'll I, I yeah. could add a little bit more yeah. i'm not quite satisfied with what i did before but maybe maybe the i'm glad he got to chapter 10 because that's that's yeah. quite the yeah. quite the finale. Yeah, no, he ends <laughs> yeah. up putting yeah. a nice bow on it. We're talking with Grant Hardy. He's a professor of history and religious studies at the University of North Carolina at Asheville, and he edited the Maxwell Institute Study Edition of the Book of Mormon, which was just published by us here at the Maxwell Institute, along with BYU's Religious Study Center and Deseret Book. And we also talked with Brian Kershisnik, an American painter. He studied art at the University of Utah and here at BYU, and also at the University of Texas at Austin. And he keeps studios in, in Kenosh. Is, is it Kenosh? Is that how you pronounce it? Yes, that's right. Yeah, okay. Kenosh, I, when I drive through there, Kenosh, Kenosh, it's Kenosh. Uh, and then also here in Provo. And I'm sure you've seen his work. He did a beautiful uh, image of the nativity with all these angels surrounding Mary and Joseph. Uh, and another beautiful painting, She Will Find What Was Lost, with angels coming down and blessing a woman. And he did the woodcuts for this edition. So, Brian, thank you so much for coming in today and, and talking with us. Oh, it's a great pleasure. I love talking. Yeah, and Grant, <laughs> talking to you guys. Yeah, and Grant, it was great having you here because all all this time we've been communicating through email it's and true. phone. I live, so I live far away, so yeah. it's it's a rare pleasure to come in and talk in person about these things. Before we go, everybody, let's check out a review of the month. This is where people review the show in iTunes and let us know what they think of the Maxwell Institute podcast. This review comes from a person who goes by Bezantine, I think it is. Bezantine went to iTunes, rated the show, and here's the review that they left. Inspiring, memorable, and enjoyable. Insights from the Maxwell Institute podcast often make it from my run or commute into conversations at home, especially now that my wife is eating the show up too. Thank you all for the work you put into this, and please keep them coming. You're welcome, Bezantine. Thank you for leaving your review. We also received a review from someone called Ben 19 I think it is. Uh, they said the podcast is a great resource for honest dialogue about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Uh, appreciate that. Now, if you'd like to be a reviewer of the month, all you have to do is actually leave a review. Um, it's really fun to read all the reviews that come in, and, but it also helps people discover the show. We'll see you next time on the Maxwell Institute podcast.